Hey, what's up? This is Mr. Ippolito, and today I'm going to explain to you the Constitution Interactive Notebook, specifically the vocabulary that is on page seven. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. First of all, I want to show you uh, this is page seven right here. So this is what we're going to be going over, and I will let you know that uh, the image you can just whatever image you think corresponds to the definition, that's what you can put in here. So if that's the only reason why you're here is to figure out what do I put in the image, you can do a Google image search. And if that picture makes you think of this term right here, then you're in good shape. That, that's all I need. I'm not trying to overcomplicate the image part. Really what I want you to know is the definition. This right here, which is why we're spending a little bit of time talking about this. So let's go ahead and continue. So let's go ahead and start with the three-fifths compromise. Now, for uh, some of these, I'm not going to click. There we go. Uh, I'm not necessarily going to give you the definition, but I'm going to tell you where to find the definition because you've already learned this. So why would I just like you should go and look in your resources that you have. Your definition for the three-fifths compromise is the answer to this question right here. Should enslaved people be counted as part of the population? And how did the Constitution deal with that? Well, they dealt with it with the three-fifths compromise. So if you look at this handout and you look at what you put in this box right here, that is the three-fifths compromise. Now, you may be wondering, Mr. Blito, uh, I still don't know. Well, where do I find this? Well, you can read this because this gives you the answer right here. This paragraph right here talks about the three-fifths compromise, and you still may be wondering, where do I find this, Mr. Ippolito? Well, it was a paper handout. It was this assignment right here. You can look it up in Google Classroom. There's the reading, there's the handout. And if you're like, Mr. Ippolito, uh, help, I still don't know what to do. Well, you can either watch my video there, or you can go back and listen to Clint Smith, because he talks about the three-fifths compromise and, if you go right into that video and go to 401, then you can learn all about the three-fifths compromise. Now, you may be wondering, Mr. Polito, why don't you just tell me? Because this is not just about, uh, you know, like reciting. This is not just about like quoting or copying and pasting. This is about learning. And so I'm trying not to just like, here's the answer. Here you go, which I'm, I'm happy to do sometimes, but I don't want to do it this time because we've already learned this. So this is actually going to serve as a review for you, right? So if you're not, if you're not quite clear on the three fifths compromise, then go back, go back to your notes, go back and do the reading, go back and watch the video starting at 401, because apparently you, maybe you didn't quite learn it the first time. And so this is an opportunity for you to learn it the second time. So that's the three-fifths compromise. Let's move on to the great compromise. Now, the best place, of course, you could Google this just like you could Google any other definition, but we've already talked about this and we already have a great breakdown of the, of the great compromise because there are three parts to the great compromise. And if you want to go back and find it, you go to, in Google Classroom, go to your constitutional convention takeaways. This is from the Charlie Brown video. And if you look on slide six, the question was, what are the three parts of the great compromise? Now, this student whose name... I am not revealing for the sake of anonymity. This student only put one of the three parts of the Great Compromise. There are three parts. So all money bills must be made in the lower house. In other words, all bills that are going to become a law that deal with spending money have to start in the House of Representatives. That's what this student right here was trying to say. So if you're like, hmm, my definition or my answer here does not have three parts, well, guess what you can go and do? You can go back to the Constitution Convention Pear Deck and you can watch the Charlie Brown video and you can watch George Washington, cartoon George Washington, at 16 minutes and 17 seconds explain the three parts of the Great Compromise. I'm not going to tell them to you, but you can look there. You could also, another great place, another great resource, which we haven't really used much so far this year, is your textbook. If you look up in the back of the book in a place called the Index, you look up Great Compromise and you can find it in there as well. So if I were going to tell you, if you're preparing to study, you're studying for, the, for an exam, you're studying for my unit exam, the best place to look is in your notes because that's what we've learned. Like that was the material where we were learning from. That's the best place. So where I'm telling you Google Classroom and all the resources we've already learned, that's the best place to go. The second best place to go would be your textbook because the textbook has information that is specific to eighth grade U.S. history. Then go to Google. The problem with Google is Sometimes you get too much information, and if you're just copying and pasting, you're not demonstrating that you truly understand, right? On the test, 
A copy and paste is not going to be good enough. You're going to have to demonstrate that you actually know the material. Okay, moving on. Direct democracy, I am going to teach you a little bit about this uh, because we haven't learned about this yet. So this is the difference between direct democracy and representative democracy or representative government or republic, right? A direct democracy is when the people vote directly on a law and then boom, it becomes the law of the land. That is direct democracy. We got that from ancient Greece and in America, we still do that today, kind of at the state level, not at the federal level, right? Not at the level of the United States. Um, we'll talk about representative government in just a moment, but let's talk about uh, direct democracy. So for example, back in 2008, there was a ballot initiative on the California state ballot called Proposition 8, where basically the courts, a couple a year or two before, the courts had said that same-sex couples were allowed to marry. And there were some people in California, and it frankly, it reverberated kind of around around the country. This 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 issue that was in California was kind of, you know, there was a great discussion and debate over it uh, around the United States. But there were specifically people in California saying, no, that uh, we need to, you can see this sign right here, protect marriage, protect traditional marriage. Marriage is supposed to be between a man and a woman, and we need to vote yes. They were saying vote yes on Proposition 8 to basically take away the right of same-sex couples to get married. So if you vote yes, you are saying that marriage should just be between a man and a woman. And it was just put to, it was put directly to a vote of the voters of California. And these were the results. 52% of Californians said, yes, marriage, should, we should eliminate the right of same-sex couples to marry. And only 47% said no. And so California, for a brief time until it was overturned by the courts, and ultimately in the Obergefell case, Supreme Court case of 2015, now same-sex uh, marriage is legal in all 50 states. And the reason why is because uh, the Supreme Court said that it was denying equal protection under the law, uh, and it was, it was denying people's 14th Amendment rights. So uh, that's part of your rights as a citizen is to get married to whomever you choose, regardless of whether they are a man or a woman and regardless of whether you are a man or a woman. So, however, all that to say that in a direct democracy, the people can just vote directly on laws, just like California voters did here in Proposition 8, and they eliminated temporarily eliminated the right of same-sex couples to marry. That is direct democracy. We still have that today in California where we can vote directly on laws and then boom, it happens. It, it is a law of the land in California. Other states have what's called the initiative process as well, or the proposition system. And then there's representative government. So representative government is different. Let me show you that graphic again. Direct democracy, people voting directly on laws. Representative government is where the people vote for elected representatives like members of Congress, and then our, the members of Congress then come together and discuss and debate and you know do all the things that they do, and then they make laws on behalf of the country. The idea behind a representative government or representative democracy is that the people can't be burdened with learning about all of the things that go into government. And so we're going to we're going to hire people. We're going to vote for people to basically take care of creating laws for us so that we as the people don't have to. Now, uh, we do have in California, in addition to direct democracy, we have a legislature that meets in Sacramento and they make most of our laws. But there's also a way through the proposition system for Californians to vote on laws directly. In the United States, there is no, the people cannot vote directly on laws, right? We are a representative, so we're not a true direct democracy in the United States. We are a representative democracy because if we want a law to pass, you need to suggest it to these people right here in Congress in Washington, D.C., and then they all come together. This is actually, this is all of them at one time uh, because this is for a State of the Union address where you can see the senators and members of the House of Representatives, they all gather at one in one place at one time to hear the president speak one one night a year. And then there are all the guests in the second floor up in the gallery there. Uh, but essentially in a representative government, Congress, and this in our country, it's Congress that makes the laws in the United Kingdom, it's parliament that makes the laws. Um, but essentially that's what a representative uh, government is. We vote for elected representatives that make laws for us. The people of the United States cannot directly vote on laws. Okay. Next vocab term, Magna Carta. I'm not going to talk too much about this. Let me go ahead and just kind of throw a 
This is a Google definition from dictionary.com, which I, I think is a fine definition. And for the sake of this assignment, you can go ahead and throw it in there. Basically, Magna Carta uh, was a document that was signed by King John on the fields of Runnymede in the year 1215. And, we're, and we have such a great lesson on it, too, about how Magna Carta connects to the Declaration of Independence and the United States Constitution. And so I will go into great depth there. So for the purpose of this vocab assignment, since this is going to be due before we learn about Magna Carta, we'll learn about Magna Carta next week. Um, you can just go ahead and just write like a dictionary definition. You can uh, you can do a Google definition because you're going to learn more about Magna Carta. And actually, you may have from your seventh grade history teacher, you may have already learned something about Magna Carta as well. Essentially, King John was a cruel and unreasonable tyrant of a king, and he was taxing his people unfairly. And finally, the barons, right, the lords, the nobles were like, dude, you need some limits placed on you. So essentially, Magna Carta was the first time ever in the history of Europe, that a document was created that said, you know what, the monarch, the king can't just do whatever the monarch or the king wants to do. Uh, and the citizens have some basic rights. So it's, it's kind of exploring this. It's kind of like the first constitution of Europe, basically, is what Magna Carta boils down to. We'll learn more about that later. So I don't want to bog get, get you bogged down in details. Um, but there's, oh, there's the scene right there. There's King John, who, by the way, um, was represented in the Robin Hood story. So if you, if you watch Robin Hood, Disney's Robin Hood, he's, uh, he, they call him Prince John there. Uh, there is King John right there. His brother was King Richard the Lionheart, if you learned that in seventh grade history as well. And there he is signing the document, uh, Magna Carta, the Great Charter on the fields of Runnymede. And then finally, habeas corpus, and I don't want to take up too much time because we're going to learn about this as well, but essentially habeas corpus, and this is just a definition that is Googled. Um, habeas corpus is the idea that government, and this came from Magna Carta, government cannot just throw you in jail if they don't like you and throw you in there for an indefinite period of time. So if the government is going to imprison you, if they're going to throw you in jail, they have to, there has to be a good reason why, and they have to kind of get the ball rolling on getting you a court date, uh, getting you in front of a judge, getting you an attorney. Uh, those are all your habeas corpus rights, right? In other words, you can't just um, you can't just throw somebody in prison or in jail indefinitely and just not give them the opportunity to defend themselves or to enter a you know a guilty or not guilty plea. They have to get the ball rolling. That's the that's basically the right of habeas corpus, which was first affirmed in 1215 in England in Magna Carta. Okay, well, that is, oh, there's one more. It's the Bill of Rights. And you should know the Bill of Rights. It's the first 10 amendments of the Constitution. That's simple. First 10 amendments of the Constitution. Okay, I have spoken enough. Uh, and that's it for me. And so there you go. And if you need any more help on vocab, then come talk to me. But hopefully that was a good, that was a good helper for you to try to get this under 13 minutes. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Hope you enjoyed. Bye-bye.